about. It's called The Missionary Crisis. Uh, in a nutshell, this is Paul's philosophy on missions. Where should missionaries come from? How are they qualified to be missionaries? How do they prepare to be missionaries? How does a church send out and support missionaries? What should a missionary do on the field? How should a missionary report back to the church? Uh, just a lot of different details on missions and missionaries and the church's connection to missionaries. And so he's got probably eight or 10 copies of this book that he's willing to give you. Um, take it if you're, you're genuinely interested. Take it if you will promise to read it. And it could be you, you read it, bring it back, put it on the resource table at the back, and someone else can pick it up and read it again after you. So we'll take these over to the fellowship hall, um, put them out. You can grab one while you're eating and take it with you. Also, they have new prayer cards as well, and I'm sure the kids are happy about this too, uh, because the last one was from about six, eight, 10 years ago, something like that, they were a lot shorter. Uh, so uh, I think there's probably enough cards for everybody to have one. Uh, take it, put it in a, a very prominent spot in your house that will remind you to pray for the Snyders, um, and we'll have those over there as well, okay? All right, I'm finished. Come on, Paul, show us Christ. Good morning. If you'd open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to thank you so many for so many years of faithful partnership in the gospel to the core of why people. Uh, it's uh, always uh, very exciting for us to be back here. This is really what I call our second home church just because of the history here we have with you and with the uh, Pastor Mark and the elders. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 12 through 17, so follow along with me. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Pray with me. Father, I'm so thankful for this text. I thank you, uh, thank you personally for the book of 2 Corinthians. Thank you for its teachings. I pray now that you would guard my mouth and that it would be... Um, a sweet fragrance to you as we open up these texts and look at what you have us to know. Father, I pray that you would help us to know you better, that we may know you in the power of your sufferings and the fellowships of your sufferings, being conformed to the image of you. So fill us this morning with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding that we may walk worthy of the calling of which you have called us. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The church was designed to obey several biblical mandates. One of those mandates is to glorify God through the preaching of the word. The scriptures must be the central focus of the church. When the church does not obey the word, it will always find itself in spiritual chaos. Usually, when a church is in spiritual chaos, either its shepherd or shepherds are living in sin, they are disregarding the teaching of Scripture, or the people, the congregation, are not listening to the truth of Scripture proclaimed from the elders. Leaving the shepherds, leaving the elders in a state of discouragement. Now, the Corinthian church would not be a church that any rational-minded pastor would want to shepherd. 
Who would want to serve this church knowing all the sin and the despair and discouragement that it had caused? Bad doctrine, sin, division, hostility, persecution, false teachers. That is enough to discourage any pastor. What I want to do this morning, I want to set just for you a few minutes a picture for us that leads up to this second letter, because I believe that's important as we look at the clear understanding of chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. So let me do that for a few minutes with you. So here's the picture. Early on, Paul leaves Corinth after a brief visit. After some time, he hears of some grievous sins like sexual immorality, fights, taking each other to court, confusion over marriage, and defiling the Lord's table. All of this is taking place in the church of Corinth. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he writes a letter addressing these particular sins. Now, that letter, that particular letter, we do not have today. That's been lost. Paul is now in Ephesus, ministering to the believers there. In fact, he's on his third missionary journey. Some time passes, and news comes again. This time it comes to him by way of Chloe's people, and we get that from 1 Corinthians 1.11, that the Corinthians are quarreling among themselves again. Now you can just imagine, if you will, imagine Paul's demeanor. Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps he hangs his head. Maybe tears are swelling up in his eyes, crying out to God, what am I to do with these people? Talk about discouragement and disappointment in the ministry. Paul experienced it. Listen to me. I, have, I don't know how many times that I've been in Papua that I have cried out to God, God, will you just do something with these people? Sin, fights, discouragement all abound. Oh, God, will you not take the preaching of the word that is faithfully proclaimed and change these people? They just won't listen. Will you do something? We can only imagine Paul's despair to hear this sad news about the church again. Okay, one time, sure. Okay, I can, I can deal with it. I can correct them. But twice, really? Again? So what does Paul do this second time that he hears this sad news? He writes... He actually writes a response to a letter that was written to him by the church, and he writes a response. We get that from 1 Corinthians 7, 1. His response is the letter we now have today, 1 Corinthians. Now, let us not think for a minute here that Paul is this casual, unfeeling apostle that writes a letter just to shut them up. No way. No way. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul could not leave his ministry in Ephesus at this time, so he sends Timothy, maybe, maybe carrying the letter of 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church. The letter... That letter, 1 Corinthians, appears to have resolved some of the disputes and problems within the church. Perhaps now there will be peace. Perhaps now there will be unity. Not for long. A new threat was looming over this Corinthian church, and the most dangerous threat yet. Now, we have threats today in our church. Church as a whole, I can just think of a few right off the top of my head. Social justice is a threat to the church. Women pastors, now that the SBC has just come out and approved that, it's a threat to the church. False teachers claiming to be just like Paul deceived the people and led them away from the truth. <laughs> 
Now, Paul receives news of this threat, perhaps from Timothy. Paul leaves Ephesus and he heads to Corinth. He's got to go. And Paul's visit to the Corinthian church this time is a disaster. Apparently, we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 and 8, verse 10, chapter 7, verse 12, that an offender openly insulted Paul, and no one in the church said one thing in his defense. Now imagine if someone comes into this building and openly insults and slanders Pastor Mark and Pastor Kevin, and no one here says a thing in their defense. Can you imagine the sorrow that would heap upon their souls? Paul returns to Ephesus and writes a tearful letter to them according to 2 Corinthians 2, 4. And Titus takes this letter to them. And guess what? That's a letter that's also been lost. So we don't have two letters that he's written. Boy, wouldn't you love to have those letters? This is where we come to the story in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. Paul leaves Ephesus. He's going to Troas, hoping to meet up with Titus. He leaves Troas from Macedonia because Titus is not there. He finds Titus in Macedonia, and the news is actually encouraging this time. Many have repented and reaffirmed their faith in the gospel and their loyalty to Paul. Although Paul receives good news, he wants to strengthen the church even more so, so he decides to write 2 Corinthians from Macedonia. And that's how we have 2 Corinthians today. My question is, wait a minute, why not go back to Corinth? If you've heard a good report reaffirming the loyalty to Paul, reaffirming the truth of the gospel, why not go back in person? After all, some in the church were accusing Paul of being too fickle. Why not go back? Doesn't Paul want to go back to Corinth? Why just write a letter? Well, according to chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians verses 15 through 16, Paul wanted to visit them on his way to Macedonia and on his way back from Macedonia. See that? Now, look at 2 Corinthians 1.23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. After the results of his last visit, Paul did not want to make another painful visit. Chapter 2, verse 1, for I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. Now, we see something in verses 12 and 13 that are for Paul, and I believe must be for us at the forefront of all of our ministry efforts. Look at verse 12, where he says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, Preaching Christ was the first reason he went to Troas. It was not to find Titus, and then while I think I'm here, I think I will do some preaching. No, Paul's aim was to preach Christ. Christ had opened a door for him in the Lord. Obviously, people in Troas were responding to Paul's preaching because Paul says, a door was opened for me in the Lord. This means that there, were an, that there was an opening to labor with positive effects. This is the kind of gospel opening that you and I would long for. This is the kind of ministry that he was having in Troas. Paul even prayed for this, and he asked the Colossians to pray this way in Colossians 4.3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. In fact, that phrase is a recurring phrase in several of Paul's letters, speaking about a door being opened. Listen, this is not some random choice by Paul. Oh, I think I'll go to Troas today. 
Paul is not aimlessly wandering around Asia Minor. Rather, he is led by God under the lordship of Christ for the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. But something is wrong. Something's wrong. Christ has opened a door to preach to the people in Turkey. This is where Churlaz is, modern day Turkey. But something's wrong. I just don't feel at rest. He says that. My spirit was not at rest. Why? Because Paul is anxious to hear about the condition of the Corinthian church. He's anxious. Now perhaps you can just see him biting his nails. Where is Titus? Where is Titus? Oh, I hope he gives me a, re a good report. He's seeing people come to faith in Christ and trust, but he cannot stop thinking about the condition of the Corinthian church. Will they follow the false teachers? Will they love me as a brother in the Lord and listen to my instruction? Have they dealt with all the sin that I addressed in my letter? Paul was so afflicted by these thoughts that the ministry in Troas seemed of little value to him. Listen to me. When you have elders that care like that, which you do here at Rosemont, you are blessed. You are blessed. There is indication that Paul was so torn apart for his love for the Corinthians that he was actually depressed. Now, I understand that. Having battled with this, and I'm not talking about, well, I just feel bad. I'm talking about a depression. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6 say this. For even when I came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. See that? You see, Paul had to deal with some serious fears, and relief for those fears was only found when he relied on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is there not some application for us here? Perhaps you might be experiencing the worst fear over a situation in your life, or find yourself in a dark prison in your mind, thinking there is no way I will ever get out of this. And I say to you that there is hope. There is hope. There is a joy inexpressible waiting for you that will shatter all your fears and all those days that seem as if the darkness will never live. Cast all your fear and despair on Christ by repenting of any known sin, any unknown sin and feed on the promises of his word and give yourself to the fellowship of the church where you can be encouraged by others that perhaps have gone through the same condition or the same situation that you now find yourself in. He will be pleased. Christ will be pleased to calm, calm your mind and calm those fears. And he'll restore the mind and give you peace. Verses 12 and 13 are placed. Now, when you look at these two, they're placed in a beautiful position to set the transition for verses 14 through 17. However, the question I had, now I ask myself a lot of questions when I study because that's just how I learn things. The question I had as I studied this, okay, Paul has already met with Titus. He's heard a good report about the Corinthian church. So why does he not mention that somewhere between verses 14 through 17? Why doesn't he mention it? Instead, we, it's almost that we get four verses that appear to be out of place from his thoughts in verses 12 and 13. Well, as I looked at this, I believe there's a reason why he didn't mention it here. Verses, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, is the heart of this letter's structure. Remember that. It's the heart of this letter's structure. From chapter 2, verse 14, to chapter 7, verse 4, Paul gives us the richest theolo theological thought on Christian ministry. 
Paul is dealing with authentic ministry while bracketing in those chapters, chapter 2, verse 7, references to Titus, references to Paul's restlessness, references to Macedonia. Now, verse 14 starts off by saying, but thanks be to God, but thanks be to God. Now, in verses 12 and 13, Paul says, I'm anxious, I'm restless. In verse 14, when he says, but thanks be to God, he is saying, so grateful am I now. So grateful am I now. Why? I believe Paul is thankful for the news he has heard from Titus, even though he does not specifically mention it here. I believe that. He is also thankful for the spiritual, spiritual fruit that have, uh, they have seen everywhere they have been, like in Troas and in Corinth. Verse 14, look at that with me. But thanks be to God who in Christ leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. That's interesting language, isn't it? Paul has Christ leading a parade of victors. Now, why this joyful language from a guy that was just recently was discouraged and depressed over the ministry in Corinth? How can there be such a sudden shift in his attitude? Paul moves from the pit of despair to marching behind Christ in a triumphal parade. Why? Because a thankful heart is always good medicine for a discouraged one. That's why. He has much to be thankful for. The phrase he says here leads us in triumphal procession is also used in Colossians 2 verse 15 where he says he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He uses that word. It's the same word he uses here. It simply means triumphs over us. And Paul has this picture in mind of a Roman parade celebrating a victorious Roman general coming home from battle. In verse 14, Christ parades his trophies on a public street. And like Paul, those of us that follow Christ in saving faith are trophies of his grace through his victorious power. And we can proudly follow our king in that parade and we can say, there's my king, there's my Lord, can't we? To the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Daniel chapter two, verse 17. Our only, tri our only true triumphs are God's triumphs over us. Do you realize that? Our only true triumphs are God's triumphs over us. Are we thankful that we are led by a sovereign Christ in all our circumstances? Every single circumstance, no matter how bad they become, do we believe in his sovereignty in those times? And what is more excellent is that they we is that we we follow our king in this triumph that he has secured for us through the victory over sin and death and hell. I will build my church but the gates of hell will not prevail or overpower it. Matthew 16:18. Oh, we may suffer setbacks and discouragements in this life. But our triumph is certain. Is it not? It's certain. That's the hope. That's the hope. Listen, how many people part from Christ at this crossroads of suffering in this world? But we are heirs 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Romans 8, 17. In verses 12 and 13, Paul spoke in the first person singular. Now, in verses 14 through 17, Paul is speaking in the first person plural. He says in verse 14, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Through us. Now, the question is, is he speaking, is this us speaking of the apostles and their ministry? Or is he including the believers in Corinth? Because he says, and through us spreads the fragrance. Well, I believe that the us here is speaking of Paul and his mission team. I don't believe he's including the Corinthians in this particular section. He uses the words dehemon and hemas, which indicate a reference to himself and his mission. But we must not think for a second, just because Paul is referring to himself and his mission team, that believers are off the hook regarding influencing people with the saving knowledge of Christ. The church is the fragrant aroma of Christ to the world. That's why we preach Christ in our homes and at work and in the world. That is why we send missionaries into the world. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how, they are to, how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the good news. The image of Christ leading the triumphal procession in 14a and making known this aroma in 14b are directly connected. They both have to do with the proclamation of the gospel in the world. See that? Because the phrase knowledge of him in verse 14 and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. The phrase knowledge of him is a specific knowledge about God's salvation. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, it appears that this aroma or uh, fragrance, which is introduced in verse 14 and is carried into verses 15 and 16, is the dominant image that fills this section with word pictures. So, the Roman emperor would sit on his throne during the triumphal procession, and he would watch the senate and the generals and the army stand proudly and march as, they, as the public saw them pass by. But there was one thing that would reach the emperor at the very end of the parade. The emperor would smell the aroma of the fragrant incense that they would be carrying. Here, Paul transitions from verse 14 to verse 15 by giving us a word picture of who receives the aroma and where it's from. See that? Now, according to verse 15, it is God who receives the aroma, is it not? For we are the aroma of Christ to God. But the aroma is not of us, but of Christ. Now, Christ is a noun, a proper noun as we know it. It's a genitive noun. But here, when he says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God, it could be that this is a genitive noun of source, which I believe it is. We are the aroma from Christ to God. You see the difference? We are the aroma from Christ to God. 
Paul was only concerned with pleasing God here. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. 2 Corinthians 5.9 This is our aim in this Christian life, to please the Lord. Offering up our obedience to him so that we are a pleasing aroma to God. That's Christianity. Listen, you can sum up Christianity in one word. Obedience. Obedience. Obedience to his word. Obedience to Christ. That is a pleasing aroma to God. To be a Christian is to be saved from an eternal death to an eternal life by Christ, in Christ, by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. That is why we can say that we are the aroma from Christ to God. Now, in the Septuagint, now the Septuagint is the first five books of the Old Testament written in the Greek language, okay? So in the Septuagint, there is a formula that is used, osman uodius. It's a formula, which means put together fragrant aroma. When those words are used in the LXX or the Septuagint, it speaks of sacrifices, of sacrifices. However, in our text, Paul does not use those two words together. Now, I found that interesting. In verse 14, he uses the word fragrance. In verse 15, aroma. In verse 16, fragrance. Again, in verse 16, fragrance. This simply means that Paul is giving us imagery of good and bad smells. The fragrance of the gospel from Paul is a good smell to God. And in verse 15, he expands the imagery of the fragrance in the triumphal procession with a positive and negative effect. He says in verse 15, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So, the gospel has an effect on those being saved, but a different effect on those perishing. The imagery of the Roman triumphal procession is still here because what would happen is captured enemies would also be displayed in the public eye, in the parade. Whatever the army captured, they would follow, and these captured enemies would be displayed in public, in the parade, ultimately to face their death. And it has been said that they would even make them carry dead, rotting corpses on their shoulders. Paul has that in mind here. For those captured enemies, the celebration in the parade was a fragrance of death. Now, according to verse 16, if you look at that, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life, this odor, this fragrant odor, stinks for the captured enemy that is being led to a certain death. For those who are perishing, the gospel stinks of death. Do you realize that? For those that are perishing, those that do not know Christ, the gospel stinks of death. This refers to those that do not respond positively, positively to the good news of Jesus Christ. Why does it stink to them that are perishing? Because they are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. This is understood from the words in verse 16, from death to death. No spiritually dead person can enjoy the sweet, all-satisfying aroma of Christ. Just can't. They are corpses, spiritually speaking. But at the same time, the Lord says in Ezekiel, he says in Ezekiel 18, 23, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord God, and not rather that they should turn from his way and live. The phrase, those who are perishing, in verse 15, 
is used in chapter 4, verse 3, where he says, and if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to who? To those that are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Listen, God's mercy and God's justice, God's mercy and God's justice are on display in verses 15 and 16. God is pleased to express his mercy to the repentant, stubborn heart. While also he is pleased to express his justice to the stubborn, unrepentant heart. When God's word is preached, it will accomplish all that it was intended, all that it was decreed to do. That is the hope of the gospel. God will accomplish all that he has determined to accomplish in his sovereign will in the salvation of those being saved and in the destruction of those perishing. Oh, that all the men and women of Winston-Salem would turn to Christ. Oh, that all the men and women of the Korowai would turn to Christ. But there is mercy and there is justice on display here in this section. Listen to me, that is why you can send, be a part of sending us to the Korowai tribe and can know without a shadow of a doubt that when the gospel is preached to those tribal people, it will accomplish all that God decreed to do in its divine will from eternity past. The gospel is a sweet smell to those that repent and believe. That's what Paul is saying here. But for unbelievers... For uh, for non-Christians, according to verse 16, to one a fragrance from death to life. I don't know about you, that's scary to me. To one a fragrance from death to death also means that this odor, this smell of the gospel and the gospel ministry anticipates their own destruction in judgment. Now, as a footnote, as we wrap this section up, I truly believe that verses 14 through 17, in verses 14 through 17, Paul is showing the relationship between the aroma of the gospel and the fragrance of his apostolic ministry. I believe Paul is defending himself here. And he needs to because, remember in the picture, those false teachers that are still present in the Corinthian church. This is why the imagery in verses 15 and 16 are so important because Paul is setting apart himself and his ministry for those, from those, you see that? He's setting apart himself and his ministry from those that are perishing. Those who are being led from death to death, spiritually dead to eternally, to an eternal death. But there's a contrast here. For those whose fragrance is from life leading to life, they follow Christ in saving faith. And that is the sweet odor to God. Do you realize that? Your salvation, your sanctification is a sweet aroma, a sweet odor to God. Now, although that is true, Paul is also verifying his authentic apostolic ministry so that the Corinthians can see that his message and his ministry is a true gospel message and ministry rising up as a pleasing incense to God. Last phrase in verse 17. Verse 16 says, Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Now, Paul answers that question in a few verses later. Who is sufficient for these things? He answers that in chapter 3, verse 5. Paul says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. He answers it there. To have a role such as the Apostle Paul 
His role had a direct, his, his role was direct from God, if you will. But it was a grave and daunting responsibility. And Paul responds, who is qualified for these things? Paul does not lead letters of recommendation from the Corinthians or any other church to become qualified for this ministry. Paul teaches us in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, that it is through the Spirit that a person receives recommendation and qualification. So the question remains, what does Paul mean and what is he trying to teach the Corinthian believers and us when he asks, who is sufficient to proclaim the gospel? After all, the gospel is the dividing line for all of humanity. This may be posed as the key question for the entire book of 2 Corinthians. Who is sufficient for these things? And I believe it's the key question for the entire book because he wants to vindicate his apostolic mission because verse 17 says, the many, for we are not like so many. I believe the many here is speaking about the false teachers that are plaguing the church. Who meets the standards? Listen, Corinth, it's not those false teachers that you have been listening to. They don't meet the standards. They are what he says he calls them. They are peddlers of God's word. Peddlers. That's an interesting word, isn't it? The word peddlers is a Greek word that is only used here one time in the New Testament. This word means someone that is a con artist or tricks people into buying a knockoff item, something that isn't real. This is exactly what the false teachers were doing to the Corinthian church. They were selling a false gospel, like so many false teachers, peddling God's word. They were con artists. Paul is saying, listen, Corinthians, I speak in sincerity and in the power of Christ, in the sight of God, not in my own power, but in Christ's power. Paul recognizes his own weakness and dependency and inadequacy. Do we recognize our own weakness? You want to know what God uses? God uses a weak, dependent person that totally is committed to his sovereign will. That's who God uses. He does not use the proud, arrogant heart. He uses the weakest and lowliest of men. That's why he does not need to trick people here, because the power of Christ rests on him alone. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. 1 Corinthians 1.17. Anyone can preach a gospel, a false gospel, in their own power, or in the power of the evil one. But someone that preaches the true gospel can only do that by divine power. I guarantee that these elders here and the elder, myself, and all those that included that we know that stand up and preach, they would rather sit down if they did not have that divine power in the pulpit. So who is sufficient to proclaim the gospel? Well, the Apostle Paul was, but it wasn't in his own power. We are only sufficient in ourselves to preach the gospel because of the new covenant work of God in us through Christ Jesus. You realize that? You're only sufficient because of the new covenant work of Christ in you. You see, it's all of Christ. It's all of him. For it is God who works in you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you see that, believer? Do you see that, that it is all of him? May the Lord bless the reading and the proclamation of his word. Pray with me, if you will. Father, I thank you so much for this time in your word to unpack a few verses.
I thank you for this section of what it teaches, that we are not sufficient in ourselves, but we are only sufficient through you alone. So help us to have that heart attitude in our lives. I pray that you would save the lost here today. Oh God, show them yourself. Grant saving faith to the lost so that they can have life, which is a fragrance of life leading to life. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.